Yes. So, uh, welcome everybody, and it is such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Laura Sands, and the only thing, the two things maybe, you know, I should record with you both, uh, with you all, and that is, number one, I am a great admirer and a huge friend of the IEA. And the second is, I'm a recovering politician. So it is fantastic to be, have this panel full of these active, wonderful ministers who are doing things that um, I sort of was rather amused just to sit back and um, enjoy all that politics from, from afar rather than right in the middle of it. Um, but I with great admiration to you all for taking this energy agenda forward in your countries. This particular agenda is about consumers and smart systems. And one of the things that obviously all politicians care about are their voters. So there is nothing more central to the debate and the structuring of energy policy than customers. But we've got a great alignment in many ways, more than in the old system, the new renewable system places demand equal to supply. And that is absolutely crucial. So in many ways, consumers have moved from being the victim of energy systems to being at the heart of them. And as policymakers, ministers will have to create the smart systems that are going to serve them and are going to ensure that we unlock their value. So consider that, um, for example, in the UK, the number of EVs by 2050 will be the equivalent of three nuclear power stations. That is the level of opportunity that customers offer. And for those who weren't here yesterday, we had the most fantastic conference, which was looking at the digitally driven demand side energy system. And the IEA have published an excellent report. So really, I would urge you to um, have a look at that um, as soon as possible. But we're here to listen to this amazing array of ministers um, who are taking forward their country's agendas and driving f forward change. So I'm really going to open this up um, and ask each of them a a an opening question, but like with all people and with all people with strong views, I'm sure we will all end up going a little bit off piece to sort of really dig into what each other are saying and learning from each other. So if I can start off with Inga, the Vice Minister for, of Energy from Lithuania, um, with a very exciting uh, role that you have. But I just wanted to understand a little more about where you felt the role of policy and regulation is to drive a sort of digitally enabled um, energy efficiency um, system. Thank you, Chair. It's a great pleasure to attend this very important meeting because energy efficiency is the first. The greenest energy is the energy which we don't use. So, uh, talking about the digitalization, we do understand that uh, transition towards uh, zero carbon economy, it's not possible without digitalization, without smart, smart systems. And when we are talking about energy efficiency measures, I, I would like just to divide them into three parts. One of uh, those parts is uh, behavioral change about uh, that uh, layer we have been talking yesterday and today. The second one is a short-term measures and the uh, third one is a long-term measures. It means a long invest a huge investments into infrastructure, insulation of buildings, renovation of buildings. But today I would like to concentrate more on behavioral changes. In order to empower people to to save energy, to deal with energy efficiency, it's very important to have a smart solutions. So when we are talking about reducing of electricity consumption, there is very important to have a smart metering system. Smart metering system of electricity, smart metering system of drinking water supply, smart metering systems for heating as well. 
But in order to have such a system and to have the best results, we should empower people just to choose the dynamic pricing and wholesale market. So then we need a liberal energy supply market. We should have a competition in this market. So therefore, politicians should have right decisions in right time in order to incentivize people to adapt to energy consumption. So then talking about the other part of uh, incentives or incentivizing end users to consume less than during peak hours and to adapt to dynamic pricing is adapt appliances at home and to have a smart system which are uh, incorporated into heating boilers and into as well heating pump system in electrical vehicles charging system as well in order to shave the peak demand so that's very important as well but when it comes to regulation and when it comes to policy makers it's very important as well to make a right decision if governments give uh, subsidies to people and give subsidies to boilers give subsidies to electrical vehicle charges it's uh, the, the smart uh, element should be must but every digitalization have a, a price as well. It's a, some kind of paradigm. When we are moving to digitalization, to smart solutions, it requires a lot of energy as well, because data centers, they consume a lot of energy. So here as well, it's a question how do we re regulate data centers. So nowadays, the European Commission uh, about uh, to finalize the new directive or a recast energy efficiency directive which put requirements for data centers to, to report every year about energy consumption as well to put some requirements concerning energy efficiency. So therefore governments should, should uh, as well to solve that problem, how to reach energy efficiency in data centers and, and how to consume less energy in that case. So, therefore, it's a very huge uh, question for the governments how to solve that paradigm, digitalization versus en energy consumption. Thank you very much indeed. And, I mean, in many ways, the Baltics has also got as a very, very digitally minded policies that have been in place much, much longer than, than many other countries. And um, so it's a, a very, very exciting road that you're going on, but definitely uh, pushing the agenda forward in Europe. Ronnie Rodriguez, uh, Vice Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. Um, as when you look at how you design um, energy policy. It's, it's interesting because citizens do have a veto on net zero. They do have a veto on our journey. And you have very successfully looked at the collaboration between different uh, stakeholders, customers, um, how industry, academia come together to actually sort of almost co-create the systems and the design of the policy, which really embeds it. Please do, do tell us more and, and let us learn from you. Thank you, Mr. Nitli Thandi. Um, it's a honor to be here, part of this panel, and the most important are you, the audience. Um, in Costa Rica, we have many experience about this situation. The first one is mandatory the long-term planning. Mm -hmm. The most important are institutions, not exactly the government, because the institution can keep the rules in order to apply the public policies. But the public policies must involve all the sectors private sector, government, academia, but the most important is the, are the consumers because inefficiency in the previous stage is a path through to the cost of the consumer. The energy efficiency is part of the ecosystem 
for Costa Rica is an error to analyze separately the um, energy efficiency. It's mandatory to apply all the concepts like uh, the environment aspects, economical growth, social aspect, because it's necessary to use the electricity and the fuels in order to create economical growth. It is important because in some cases we focus only on, only on appliance. In, in other cases, only on electricity. But we need to involve all kinds of energy. In this case, it's mandatory in order to phase out the fuels, oils, because decarbonization is up our plants and it must be part of the all public energy solution in many countries. Thank you very much. And that whole issue about placing consumers, voters, customers absolutely at the heart is, is really, really important. And I think sometimes the energy sector has sort of rather ignored the customer. So um, it's very interesting, your approach to co-creation. Thank you. Uh, William, who Deputy Minister of Energy and Member of Parliament in Ghana. Um, globally, there is a great diversity in terms of innovation of smart energy efficiency initiatives. Um, yesterday, one of our conference meetings, there was a conversation around how certain countries can actually leapfrog what, um, let's say, older incumbent system design is. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you can tell us what's happening in Ghana and how you're looking at smart energy um, initiatives and the innovation um, required. Thank you very much, madam. He doesn't like me. <laughs> What is this? You're okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're very pleased to be here, and um, good afternoon to everybody here. Um, Ghana, we've had some challenges um, somewhere in um, 2000. We embarked on a massive um, access to electricity and projects around the country, and that resulted in our, um, having a little bit of deficiency in the generation. We learned some lessons, and then one of the key lessons we learned was that as we were trying to increase generation, the energy was being sucked away by inefficient appliances in the system. Um, so that was identified, and um, we embarked on um, the road to energy efficiency. So we started very early on that road, um, albeit um, we've been moving a little bit um, slowly. Um, so what we identified was mainly refrigerators. So we identified refrigerators, lamps, and air conditioners, and then we brought out regulations to control the efficiency, and the influx and standards and labeling. Um, so that's what we did. Along the way, um, efficient air conditioners and um, refrigerators appeared on the market, which would have should have necessitated us um, amending our laws, but we kept at it because we had started this um, study, and we wanted the study to be completed before we could see our way clear. So somewhere around 2005, we had completed the study and um, realized that alone, the refrigeration and um, lamps alone were taking something around 1,000 megawatts of um, power that um, was being wasted within the, the, the system. So uh, we added, in addition to the three, 19 additional um, appliances um, in 2020 
to try and bring that. If only one appliance is losing us so much power, you can imagine what the 19 is going to do. So we have now in the regime, in the, in the Ghanaian space, a very tough regime on the standards and labeling um, for uh, appliances. But unfortunately, hard as we work, we do get influx of um, inefficient and um, dumping from our brothers um, in Europe and America. Um, we still find our appearing in the system inefficient, old, discarded um, appliances still finding their way into the uh, Ghana space. So we're working very, very hard at it, and um, some of the things that we have done to try and um, um, be efficient or have an efficient system is um, at the time when um, we realized that um, incandescent lamps were not the best way to go. Uh, the country actually brought in 11 million pieces of uh, CFL um, for people to exchange for free. Um, and subsequent to that, in the advent of um, LEDs, we've brought in an additional 12 million to change CFL bulbs to LED bulbs to reduce the amount of waste in, in the system. So these are some of the measures that we, we, we are doing. And as a result of um, some of these measures, we have calculated that we saved something like 6.3 billion tons of CO2 Ghana um, alone. And um, um, we also embarked on this exchange rebate program where old inefficient refrigerators, government gave people who brought theirs in some vouchers to be topped up a little amount for free, for new um, smart, efficient refrigerators. That too, we believe, has saved us over 200 megawatts, the system. So it's a lot is um, being done in, um, in our, our country. If you look at the distribution, for example, Ghana, I think apart from Egypt in Africa, it's the only country that is um, using distribution, um, I would call it uh, transmission distribution, um, to yet again reduce uh, uh, trans transmission transformers distribution transformers to reduce the, the losses in the system. We have upgraded our low voltage transmission lines to high voltage transmission, um, or the 161 kV to 330 kVs all through the countries. And we quite, um, like I said, we are plodding along, but um, we are very hopeful that some of these measures that we are taking, smart metering and all that, will lead to us eventually catching up leapfrogging, um, like you said, um, to be where the, our brothers are. So that's what we're doing in Ghana. Can, can I say, I think that's exceptionally impressive and really, really exciting to be absolutely bearing down on the waste. In some ways, you don't need any behavior change. You don't need to change your lifestyle. You don't need to sort of, you know, contort yourself to have a different thing. This, these are pieces of equipment. And I wonder whether those standards are now being adopted internationally. The West, West Africa... Um in the West Coast and most of Ghana, Ghana is uh, most of Africa. Ghana is now the lead, actually, and um, we have um, a lot of our brothers from the ECOWAS region and other parts of Africa coming to Ghana to learn um, from us, which we are very, very proud about. I think it's fantastic, and I think this issue of standards has been running through this um, this whole conference. So, so congratulations. Maha, very lovely to have you here, Under Secretary for Electricity, Water um, and Renewable Energy from Kuwait. Um, I always think it's really important that one ends up with uh, water and electricity being in one department so that you're actually maximizing and optimizing these systems. Um, We've had a few conversations um, today around cooling and with long hot summers in, in Kuwait, the need for cooling is the greatest source of electricity demand along with the necessity to preserve um, water. So in some ways it's a conflation of two 
key drivers of survival. The challenges experienced in Kuwait are, are replicated in many other parts of the world and, and will obviously increase. What can we learn from, from what you're doing and wh where do you see the role of digitalization actually unlocking the solutions that you need? Uh, thank you, first of all, for your organization for this conference. And uh, I'm pleased to be here in France to present my country. Uh, for whom they, know, they don't know Kuwait. Kuwait is the most hottest city in the Gulf. <laughs> so uh, our uh, consumption of air condition is like 60% of our production. Uh, we are trying uh, to do the energy efficiency by uh, maintaining, maintaining the maintenance for our power plants, for our grid, for our networking, and uh, as well as we have uh, several calls for building to reduce uh, the consumption of the electricity. And um, as well as we trying uh, to enter the behavior of uh, reducing uh, the energy and the consumption of water from the beginning, from the children. Because in studying, you enter uh, in the school how to uh, prevent uh, the consumption. Uh, as well as uh, doing uh, several of uh, announcement or uh, uh, in the television in newspaper for reducing the electricity. Uh, we all know that energy efficiency it's to achieve energy in uh, the same quality and uh, energy but in less energy. How we can do this, it's very difficult, <laughs> but we are trying our best. Uh, it's uh, in Kuwait, 50 degrees reaching uh, the temperature. Our uh, demand, 60% of uh, uh, air conditioner. We are reaching now the peak load, uh, almost 16,200 megawatt. So uh, we are expecting this uh, year almost uh, 18 megawatt, 18,000 megawatt. So it's too much. Uh, but we have like um, our Gulf uh, GCC. Uh, we can use their lines to uh, uh, export electricity from them. Digitalization is very important because uh, using, as uh, my colleague first, she said, smart meters. We are trying to use the smart meters now in our electricity and uh, also water. Uh, we have in our building um, the smart lights that can turn off if there is nobody. And we are trying to enhance the people to reduce the uh, air condition temperature during the peak load. It's like from 12 to uh, 4 o'clock. We have this is the peak load. So trying to re reduce everything and uh, to maintain uh, uh, the power for uh, our houses. And we hope we can manage this year. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real challenge yes. and it's very, very interesting what, how you're approaching this. I wonder whether some of William's standards would be useful for your air conditioning yeah. in the sense of communicating and sharing this best practice. Yeah, and also the air condition, we are putting the inverter. Uh, we are like um, uh, trying to put rules on, you know, because it's all the government should work and all uh, the ministers should work together to maintain the efficiency. Uh, so we are uh, pushing the Minister of uh, uh, what's, uh, Business yes. to put, uh, the, uh, not allow for the air, any air condition to enter to the country unless it's have the inverter. This is one of our uh, step. 
and hopefully. So it's sort of digital human beings and engineering all coming together. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chao, who chairwoman of um, Star Charge, which is um, One Bang's digital energy. Um, you're obviously at the forefront of innovation, pieces of technology, um, and the sort of technology that's available today which can pr provide individual benefits. But is there more potential energy efficiency um, when hardware plus software plus services are developed. I, I feel very strongly that business models are also really, really important where you're conflating that and you have great experience. So we look forward to hearing from you. Mm. Thanks for your question. Uh, I plan to speak in Chinese just now, uh, but I think the frank communication is more important. Uh, so I think I will speak in English. And apologize for that my language is very poor. Uh, I will try my best to describe my opinion clearly. Um, Star Charge is the biggest CPO in China. And we have built a biggest network in China. In our uh, cloud plat uh, platform, um, more than nearly 2 million Charger Poles has, is working uh, on our platform. And uh, we have hardware, our hardware including the charger, charger, the battery, the storage, home storage, and the CNI storages. Uh, and we have the converter, and we have the uh, energy looter. So, and our product is the smart microgrid. The charging station is a special microgrid. The home is a microgrid. We named HEMS, Home EMS. The charging station is charging EMS. So we call it SEMS. The building is building EMS. So we call it BEMS. The com commercial and the, the city is a smart grid, so we call them SIMS. We have so many EMS and so many smart grids, uh, smart microgrids. But I think the platform is the soul. Is the soul? Mm, it's very very important. Without a platform, every hardware and every every micro grid we are separate they are not smart and they don't can trading they don't can share to other grid so I think the platform very very important we have more than 1,000 engineer to develop these products Especially in software, we have more than 500 uh, software engineers. Now, every year, uh, we, we are engaged more and more uh, software engineers to develop this platform. In our APP, it named the Star Charge APP, more than 1,100 users is using, uh, are using it. And uh, our platform is very open. We can open our facility to other CPOs. More than 1,000 CPOs connect and working on our platform. And our platform can help them to improve the e operating efficiency. Uh, we help them to earn more profit. So you, with this platform, especially very, very smart and the wisdom platform, our hardware is more popular. Uh, we get the number one sales performance in China and uh, we export our hardware to Europe and Asia. 
because our platform very, very smart. So I think we know what is the software define the hardware. The software is the digital, but it's not enough. We first, we do every charger is smart. And then the charging station is smart. And every building is smart. Every factory, every commercial, every, every city, every country, and uh, the whole human, the whole, whole world can connect with one website. And this web is very open. And this web can share your electricity because we do how to trading. We should know every country's policy, the trading policy, the electricity policy. And we should know how to improve the charging stations, the CPO's efficiency. So we should know where to construct, where need a new charging station. And we know how to price, which price is a correct price. These, these details a lot, a lot, a lot. So I can't s s talk more in just five minutes. Even uh, every, every day, uh, a lot of countries, customer come to our company, uh, including Volkswagen, BMW, uh, Mercedes-Benz, and a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of OEMs and energy companies. We show our platform. Uh, with our platform and the hardware and our service, service including trading and the CPO business and uh, warranty um, and uh, installation. Mm, we, we can know every pain point because we do the whole value chain. So every pain point we can feel very, very clearly. We, we, we want to cover it, solve it, solve it by technology. Uh, very welcome you to Star Charge. Uh, we have our office in Germany uh, and in our business has more than six countries, not a charger, but also the every micro grades. Thanks. Can I just say, your English is absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. And it's a very important point, this. This isn't about software or hardware or services. It is about that integration and delivering a customer focused. Um, and also very interesting about your analytics, where you're constantly learning and refining the proposition through actual sort of deployment. And the energy sector is very into pilots and into testing things. Actually, we've got to go out there and do stuff, and then that's how we're going to really learn. So coming on to doing things, Google is one of those real doers who has changed our lives in many ways. And it's very, very good to have Zena here, who's managing director of Europe, the Middle East, um, and Africa partnerships at Google. I mean, we've been talking, and we all of us have been talking a lot about the demand side, about the customer. Um, in many ways, the energy sector, as you know, we've we've sort of stated, isn't always very responsive to to customers. Your understanding, you I, you know more about me than I do, and I just wanted to feel that your contribution to the energy sector, to the transition, is massive. Is potentially very, very important. Would you just explain how you're looking at the energy transition from a Google perspective and what we can all learn um, from your insights? 
Great. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, I don't know about you more than you do, but over dinner, I'm going to talk to you a lot. <laughs> so maybe I'll get there. Um, so basically, I agree with the premise of your question. And we do need to inform consumers so they make sustainable choices. Um, and and we, do, we also need to do it in their homes. Uh, at Google, we have three pillars. The first one is informing consumers, bringing them the right information so they can make sustainable choices. The second one is our own, how do we, uh, basically our own backyard. How do we have our campuses, data centers, offices operate efficiently? And the third one is partnering with governments, with agencies, with cities to also help them achieve uh, their sustainability goals. Um, here with the um, IEA, we have worked, for example, last year uh, when the energy crisis happened um, on giving users energy advice or tips on how to save energy on Google.com, on Google Search. Uh, so these were tips that were uh, done in partnership with the IEA, um, how they can save daily energy, but also what kind of grants are available, what's encouraged, for example, changing heat pumps and so on. Uh, and that was a very effective uh, partnership and an example of how we address uh, Pillar 1. Um, talking about Google, we have a very ambitious goal. We want that by 2030, we are operating um, in, a ve in a clean energy state. 24-7 all the time. That means our offices, data centers, and so on um, are all operating um, with clean energy. That means every email you send, every YouTube video you watch by then will be uh, supported by clean energy. At least that's the ambitious um, goal. Um, also, when we build data centers, we want them to be very efficient. Um, Today, our data centers are uh, twice as efficient as a uh, typical data center. We've also worked a lot on this in the past. Um, and uh, today, um, you, you, we can have five times more computer um, power, basically, from a data center with the same electricity as five years ago. So that's the advancement on this side. And then finally, um, helping government, governments, users, city. I'll take two examples. Uh, one is with UPS. Uh, so we've partners, we've partnered with UPS, um, or Google Cloud partnered with UPS, so that they can use AI to design uh, their routing, the routing of their vans, um, and to reduce emissions to, and to use less fuel. The outcome, it was a saving of 10 million gallons of fuel a year. Um, another example, there's a project called um, Project Greenlight, and this is where we actually partner with cities, and we give them data on traffic light and how cars stop and start at traffic lights. And then we give this data, and the cities can have their city engineers redesign traffic lights so that cars stop less and that there is less emissions. Uh, and we've seen significant reduction in emission and stop and start and air quality um, in certain cities. Uh, like Budapest or Haifa or just now we are um, launching in Hamburg. So these are the examples of how uh, we are addressing the agenda. I think it's very exciting and what is particularly interesting is the energy sector is, is in many ways extending itself into transport, into data and digitalization, into how to manage the water system. We are moving into becoming integral to lots of other sectors. Um, we have only a few minutes left, and I wanted to ask the panel to comment on each other and say, what, from listening to all these extraordinary examples, which one are you going to take from somebody else back to your 
um, to your country, to your company, um, that you feel you've learned, because there's just so much rich ideas and thinking. Um, I'm, you know, really finding this conference extraordinary from the point of view of learning. So, Inga, um, name name your winner. This isn't the Eurovision Song Contest, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> what are you. the things that you've learned? Thank you, Chair. I suppose that the most the, the most important message today is that we need data. We need data in order Absolutely. to make a right policy decision, in order to give the information for investors where to invest, how to invest. So therefore it's very important to open data, which are possible to open to the society, for the industry as well, and open data for, for municipalities as well, because municipalities are very important to make decision concerning the energy efficiency, development of renewables in the sector, and here it's very important to give them a message how much they are green, how much energy did they save. So therefore it's very open to have a public available data, you know, scoreboard, how much energy one or other municipality saved. Then we have a competition element. It means that we push each other to be more efficient, to, to be more green. So therefore open data, interactive maps might be some interactive information for the municipalities to the government and open data, so that's a crucial element in order to be efficient and green, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Inga. <laughs> in the new generation belongs to the digital culture. It's easier for them to incorporate these ideas, so uh, we need to take advantage in order to implement the smart system, smart cities, smart building, and everything. Because the only way to deal with the new clean energies in order to phase out the fuels, oil fuels, to go the meta in order to solve the decarbonization, is to incorporate technology. And the society, the young people, the universities have the responsibility to create new solution and be part of the solution too. Thank you. And William. You know what they say about um, politicians? You may ask me any question you want, but I'll give the answer I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, why am I surprised? <laughs> You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> Maybe. I think um, I'll go on Google. A Ghana a government through the Energy Commission of Ghana, we've um, set up this app um, that links the, that's part of the drive for efficiency, that links the buyer and the seller together for appliances. Um, it gives you through the Google map the address, the telephone number of um, the seller so that you can go and get it. And through this app, we can verify um, using the STAR system whether indeed the equipment you bought is the genuine um, item. Um, so we, we Google and we, I think we need to deepen it a little bit. But I would also like to use this um, platform to let the whole world know that this drive for efficiency as far, as far as African countries are concerned, Ghana in particular, my country and other African countries, that is the shared responsibility. It really is. Um, this afternoon during lunch, I was talking to the Commissioner for Energy, uh, African Union, and um, we talked about this um, shared responsibility. The dumping, um, I, I touched on it, and I'd like to actually put a little bit more ink in it. The dumping of these inefficient um, equipment, uh, appliances in African countries, the, it goes to affect this energy transition that we have, the, the reduction in carbon emissions and all that. It's going to affect all of us. Only. So we need to see it as a shared responsibility for all of us to work together. Um, it was mentioned that these um, factories need to be cited in Africa so that we can 
factories for production of appliances to be sited in Africa so that we can have more control on the quality of equipment or the appliance that's churned out. But the problem is most of these um, investors, they come to Africa and what they see is the proliferation of um, inefficient used um, appliances being dumped in Africa. So if they were to put up their factories in Africa, they will still be in this disadvantage because of our low level of incomes. People will naturally gravitate towards cheap, inefficient stuff. So we need from the side of um, the Europeans, Americans, um, to do the habit to stop the manufacture and export of inefficient um, appliances to Africa whilst we are doing our bit. I think that's a very, very clear message, and, and thank you for that. And I didn't recognize that that was happening, so very important. I hope. What have you learned? Uh, I would like to, William, how he managed uh, the error. Not to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to know how they manage the air conditioner uh, yes. consumption. And uh, from Google, uh, we recently have an agreement with Google, a service agreement uh, to, for, for IT. So I have to. <laughs> I'm the winner. Wonderful, you are the winner. That is definitely the case. And Cha, what have you, what have you learned uh, or are going to take back to China? I especially agree the first lady's opinion that data should uh, be open yeah. and especially every government should uh, pay more attention on the energy digital. Mm. Normally, uh, officer, mm, normally it's very, very hard for a government officer to get uh, uh, such data. Mm. They, he don't know, he doesn't know how much electricity, green electricity, uh, his, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And he, don't know, he doesn't know uh, how, how many kilowatts the PV is. So every month mm, they call, call, call the yes. enterprise. If the government has a digital platform, he can know every uh, data at the real time, and now we Star Charge has uh, cooperated with several governments, and we open our data into to them. I think it's very important. I totally agree, and very much uh, UK government's policy is presumed open all energy data. Zena, our finale. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for me, most a lot of you told good stories on that, and I think William and Maha in particular, um, whether you are facing a challenging time, i.e., you know, in the two, what you talked about in the 2000s, you have to keep going, you have to make the change happen, or if it's a geographical challenge, like in Kuwait, where it's very hot, because both of you or both of your governments could have decided to say, well, this is how it is, you know, economy doesn't allow it, weather doesn't allow it, but I think what I really admired in your stories is the fact that you actually did something about it. So thank you. And that's what this conference is all about. Thank you for that finale, because it is about doing something um, about and really taking next steps tomorrow, not the day after. Um, we've had a huge range of different um, approaches all of which actually all build the digital energy efficient um, system of the future. Uh, from standards, engineering, behavior change, long-term policy, really important, um, hardware working with services, and dig all empowered and enabled by digitalization. And never ever forget that the customer comes first. Thank you all so much. Fantastic panel. Um, and um, I think it's time for a break now. Thank, Thank you. you.